Good morning, everybody. Keith Engel for TGI Sports Talk. It's Friday, the 13th of November. Hopefully, uh, none of us are afraid of the number 13. Just another day, guys. Just another day. Uh, welcome you in today. Thank you all for following the show. The followers have been growing uh, pretty rapidly here the last month or so. Um, I want to thank all of you, as I said, for viewing and following the show, uh, continuing to share it, which uh, helps us increase the followers. I want to thank all the groups that allow me to share the the, the webcast on their uh, group pages. Uh, there's a lot of them, uh, a lot of uh, classic baseball uh, sites, current baseball sites, football, the same thing, basketball. Um, they're kind enough, a lot of them, to let me share the show uh, with their followers. Sometimes there's thousands of them, uh, which is helping us get some brand awareness, right? And uh, and be followed uh, even more. And also my uh, association with the Mac and Jack show has helped. Uh, I'm a fr I appear every Friday morning right after this show. We talk about the Patriots. Um, I actually got the guest host uh, with uh, Mac filling in for Jack, which is a tough job earlier this week. So I want to thank them. Um so all, all, all the groups, just know that if I share this to your page, there's content uh, that uh, will be relevant to you, especially today to the sites I share this interview with, Marty Appel will be my ho uh, guest uh, here in a bit. Uh, before I get to that, I want to thank last week's guest, Fred Mitchell, uh, formerly with the Chicago Tribune. We talked about the Bears. We talked about uh, Gail Sayers. We talked about a lot of different stuff, and uh, we really got a we, – we had a nice conversation. It was enjoyable to talk to Fred um, you know, somebody outside of the New York market a little bit uh, more. Um, and we've got some good guests coming up here soon. Uh, as I mentioned, today's guest uh, is Marty Appel. Marty, I did, and, I, and just a uh, uh, little preliminary here. I did record this interview, oh gosh, a couple months ago. One of my first interviews. So you'll see probably in the beginning of it, I'm a little bit nervous. Marty's I really looked up to Marty for years. He worked for the Yankees, gosh, from, I guess, 60. Well, he'll get into it in the uh, uh, in the interview, but 68 to 77, he was uh, in the Yankees with, with a lot, worked for the Yankees in a lot of different uh, roles, uh, most notably public relations director as uh, the, the Steinbrenner Yankees returned to prominence in the 70s. Uh, he later produced the, the, the television broadcast for WPIX and, He's had a lot of other roles, and he is the – he doesn't like being called this, uh, or he doesn't call himself this, and he won't, but, uh, you know, I call him the historian uh, for Yankee baseball, and also baseball in general. He's written, written many, many books, um, you know, about the Yankees and baseball in general, but uh, things that are, that are relevant to the Yankees, Pinstripe Empire, uh, Life and Death, The Life and Death of a Yankee Captain, Thurman Munson's Story. Uh, 160, 162 and 0, uh, the greatest wins in Yankee history. Great read. Now pitching for the Yankees, another great read. He's written Pinstripe Pride, uh, biographies about DiMaggio and Stengel. He's the go-to guy for Yankee history and baseball history in general. So I was a little nervous when I did this interview. It was one of my first, and it'll probably come through at least early in the interview. I was also using Zoom. Uh, Marty wasn't comfortable with, with the, the StreamYard app. And uh, so we'd use Zoom to, for his comfort level. And uh, I, I apologize for Marty for not getting this interview on sooner. I had some technical gift difficulties with, uh, you know, restoring the recording and, and getting to where I could play the recording. And as my technical wizardry has, has increased here, um, we've gotten to where we can play that here in a second. Um, and I want to thank Marty. And again, apologize for getting this on late. And uh, I think uh, it, it really became a, a really good interview once I got past my initial nervousness. It's very easy to see in the beginning. I hate to point that out, but I think you'll see it. Because um, now I'm, I'm a polished veteran that I am today. Good grief. Um, we'll talk a little bit. Now, after the interview, I'll be back uh, to wrap up the show. It's beautiful. It, it, Again, it's that's the beauty of, of being able to do this. So we do it live. I try to get the guests on live when I can because I think that's the best way to do it. Um, but when I've got some people that uh, either aren't early risers or are on the West Coast or the you know the Midwest, 
we do some uh, recordings um, or if timing isn't good for them. So I think it's worked out pretty well. We were roughing out, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're rough, getting out the rough edges and um, I think it's all good. So, uh, you yeah, know, again, Friday the 13th, don't be afraid of that number 13. It's a little dreary here, unfortunately, in East Greenbush, New York. We are broadcasting live, the first live webcast from uh, East Green, Greenbush. I don't want to leave that out for those that love hearing about that, Mark. Um, but Marty, again, we're, you're going to see in this, Marty, we cover a lot of stuff in uh, his career a little bit, but mostly the 70s Yankees and, and a little bit, uh, we elaborate a little bit on that. So there's some really cool stories, uh, some, uh, you know, things that uh, the Yankee lore that I wanted to make sure was accurate and uh, accurate. And uh, Marty confirmed that most of it was. So hopefully we've had no technical difficulties up till now on this live uh, portion. Um, I know when I did the last taping interview, my portion live was a little bit uh, messed up. Hopefully it's coming through okay today. I'm going to now share that interview, so bear with me when I while I uh, get the logistics uh, put to bed here, and then uh, I will be back after the Marty Appel interview. So watch the interview. I'll be back to say goodbye and wrap it up a little bit, and we'll talk about the guests that we have coming up here in the next few weeks, which I'm really excited about as well. So I'll see you in a little bit. All right. Good afternoon, Marty. I appreciate you joining me here today on TGI Sports Talk. And, Thank you. Uh, Great to be with you, Keith. I, again, it's, uh, you're one of the, the people that I had on my uh, hit list, and I was glad you got back to me, even though it was a bit later, because <clears throat> Facebook does what Facebook does, I guess. So uh, We're here in uh, East Greenbush, New York, as I uh, mentioned a minute ago. We're the first live sportscast uh, webcast, as far as I know, so we're going to continue to promote it that way. And you are uh, uh, broadcasting live across the United States and the world, hopefully. I've had a few views from England, I know, so if you might want to make sure that your uh, proper grammar is in place today. We, um, my wife and I usually go to London every summer because we love it there and not this summer. So <laughs> the timing is good. It makes me think of that. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe somebody you know was watching the show. <laughs> So you've, you've had, had a, you know, obviously, <clears throat> uh, in the intro I gave for you, I mean, it, you've had quite a career, obviously, uh, all of it or most of it surrounding baseball. Um, and I know the Yankees have circled back into your, uh, your sphere of time and again, of either working for them. I know you worked for them from 68 to 77, and you were, I guess, a bit of a wonder kid then, right? I mean, you were still in college when you started working for the Yankees. It's true. Um, my first job was answering Mickey Mantle's fan mail. That was the summer of 68, his final season as a player. And what a treat for me, who grew up in New York as a Yankee fan, and of course, Mickey Mantle fan. There I am working with Mickey Mantle. It was an amazing thing. That'd be pretty cool. So you answered as Mickey Mantle? Uh, no, we weren't fooling anybody. Oh, okay. um, you know, people would write to him. Almost all the letters turned out to be similar. Dear Mickey, you're my favorite player. Please send me an autograph baseball. <laughs> so I don't know if they really expected to get an autograph baseball in the mail, but they would get a little uh, facsimile signature on a printed picture of Mickey. Sure. And probably getting that Yankee envelope in the mailbox was a treat for them. So I think we spread some happiness. Well, that's good. It's a great, it's a great way to get the start of your, your career. And I mean, you really moved up the organization pretty quickly. Um, I did. It was um, it was a quest, a matter of George Steinbrenner buying the team from CBS. Uh, I had been Bob Fischel's assistant starting in 1970, assistant PR director, which was pretty heady stuff for me then. Just out of college, now I'm the assistant PR guy for the Yankees. Um, traditionally in baseball back then, when the team hired a PR guy, they were generally older people who were around the team for many years, um, maybe a columnist for a local newspaper or something. 
But Mr. Steinbrenner bought the team in January 73, and uh, by the summer, the fall of that year, um, Bob Fischel left. So he had to hire a replacement. He was so new himself, he didn't really know the culture of the game as to who you typically hire as your PR guy. So I was Bob's assistant. He asked me if, he, if I felt I could do the job. And I did say yes, didn't exaggerate it. I'd been learning from Bob Fischel the best there was. Yeah. So I did know I could do the job and I told him I could. And I got hired. <laughs> did you, uh, did you uh, have a full grasp? Do you feel you had a full grasp of what you're actually jumping into with, uh, with the Yankees at that point in time? Well, I did at that point in time. Of course, we didn't know it was going to evolve into a daily controversy, the Bronx Zoo years. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little more than I signed up for, but the day-to-day -day operation, dealing with the press, managing the press box, handling various requests of different sorts that would come into the team, I could do that. Today, there's probably almost 70 people doing what I did back then. I know that sounds ridiculous, but a lot of them are scoreboard people. Yeah. And our scoreboard was <clears throat> far less sophisticated than today. But I would program the scoreboard each day, welcoming different groups who were visiting the stadium, wishing happy birthday to people. And today it's a major production that actually has a DGA television director supervise the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but I was doing promotions, I was doing sponsor relations, I was doing broadcast relations, um, making a lot of speeches, public speaking. So, uh, yeah, I, I did count one day. There were like 70 people doing what I did. Well, you got paid the salary of 70 people probably back then, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little less. But one thing that was interesting about the salary was it wasn't far removed from what the players were making. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, the world has changed a lot, right? And I was their age, and we were similar economic stat, uh, status. So in those days, you would actually form friendships with the players, go out to lunch or dinner with them, argue over who <laughs> who was paying, or, you know, all well, right, you had the iced tea, you know, so it was like that. Um, but you can't do that today. All my PR friends tell me. But back then, it was you could be friends with the players. Well, that's good. Well, yeah, it's a different world today. I'm sure you can't. Uh, yeah. it, it'd be hard to. It'd be hard to, to just be on the same level, I guess, with them today. I mean, in your capacity too. I mean, you got to meet legendary Yankees. You know, <laughs> going back in time, DiMaggio and Yogi and Casey. Well, maybe not Casey. Keith, that was the best part for me because mm -hmm. with the responsibility came planning Old Timers Day. Yeah. Uh, so, you got to remember, I mean, I started in 68. There were players around from the 20s. Right. Um, I knew Roger Peckinpah, who managed the Yankees in 1914. Wow. And on Old Timers Day, we would bring back some of the Murderers Row Yankees, Joe Dugan and Earl Combs and Wade Hoyt and Bob Shockey. This was, to me, this was remarkable stuff because I appreciated it. I, I was a Yankee fan who knew their whole history. Today, when people think of me as one of their principal historians, I knew those guys. <laughs> so uh, for me to Call Joe DiMaggio or Tommy Henrik, Gomez, Ruffing, and you know make arrangements for them to come either to spring training for a visit or to Old Timers Day. What a thing that was for me! What an opportunity. Well, I mean, you you I think you undersell yourself when you call yourself one of the principal historians of the Yankees because I think you are you are the historian of the Yankees in my mind. With well, all thank the, you. With all um, the work, there's with no all such the official time. position for, on the you know with the Yankees. So I'm always careful not to say the, um, but like, you know, like NBC News will introduce Michael Beschloss as a White House historian. Mm -hmm. That's not an official White House job. So yeah. I think of describing it the same way with the Yankees. Oh, the number of uh, works you have out there. I mean, I, 
I've read virtually. I think there's a couple. It's funny as I was as I was doing some research. There's actually a couple of books I don't have that I got to get on my Kindle. Um, but I've read a lot of your books. You know, the 162 and 0, the perfect season was a great book. Um, now pitching for the Yankees might be my favorite one, actually. Oh, thank you. Um, but I didn't read the. There was one about the King Kelly, which I didn't know about. And I've, I'm, I'm trying to get that on Kindle. I don't know if I could find it. It might have been on something else, but it's just such good. I mean, they're, they're such great reads. If you're a Yankee fan, people, please, you've got to get Marty and Bell's work. All of it. I mean, you can fill your library with his, with your stuff. You've written bios of Stangle and Yogi and DiMaggio and Munson, King Kelly, as I said. Um, I, I mean, Eric Gray, did you write out, uh, or were you maybe... You wrote the autobiography, uh, not the autobiography, the biography for Eric Gray? Autobiography, you know, those are as, as told to. So yeah, I did right. with Eric, it was as much fun as a project could be. He was a wonderful guy. He's a, for those who don't know, he was a National League umpire who was easily distinguished on the field for being African-American and for being way overweight. Uh, a really fun guy to be with. But an interesting life, too, because, as you would imagine, kind of a lonely life, being the only African-American in the profession. Um, and my book agent, Bill Adler, put us together. And, boy, a warm friendship grew out of that. And it's a fun book. I don't know. If it's. I mean, I know it's not in print anymore, but if people can find it, it's called Working the Plate, which has a double meaning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there was that. Yeah, I've got to look for that one too. It's another one that I missed. Uh, I came across on the list. So, yeah, well, let's go back to the Yankee years. So you start '73. I mean, George is suspended. Uh, I guess suspended. I'm not sure exactly how involved he actually made himself during that time. Um, but Ralph Hawk gets fired. Bill Verdon comes in. I'm still fairly young. I moved into my getting into my middle teens then. And I was a big Bobby Mercer fan. 74 was one of my favorite seasons, to be honest with you. Because the Yankees weren't expected to do all that well. They're in a pennant race. And uh, you know, George wasn't around yet. We really didn't know who George Steinbrenner was in 1974 yet, um, because of his other situation. Um, but that's one of my favorite years, and then kind of after that, things start to change a lot, right? My my hero Bobby gets traded for Bobby Bonds. Verdon's out for Billy, you know, the next year. And then kind of things start to be a whirlwind from there. It's true. It was the beginning of what came to be known as the Bronx Zoo years. Um, when you mentioned Bobby Mercer being traded, I mean, he was the most popular player on the team. And Mr. Steinbrenner himself had told him, you're a Yankee for life. He'll always be here. I remember reading that in Bobby's book. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Gabe Paul, who, <clears throat> who was handling transactions in the roster and serving as general manager, <clears throat> traded him to the Giants for Bobby Bonds, Barry's father. Well, I liked Bobby a lot. And <clears throat> he was one of the great all-around athletes that I ever knew, he and Dave Winfield. Um, but it broke my heart, and professionally, to trade our most popular guy was a tough blow. So I remember being in Gabe Paul's office when he actually phoned Bobby Mercer to say that, actually, the conversation went like this. Bobby, Gabe Paul, listen, I've got some news for you. Uh, I'm not sure how you'll take it, but I think you, upon reflection, you'll realize it's good news. We've traded you to the San Francisco Giants. Oh, they have great restaurants in San Francisco. <laughs> and he went on about that. And the last part of the conversation was Gabe saying, what's that? Oh, Bobby Bonds. Take care, Bobby. <laughs> so at the end, Mercer said, who'd you get for me? He was stunned. I was stunned. And I said to Gabe Paul, uh, Gee, I'm going to miss him. He's such a good guy. And Gabe said to me, Gabe had been in baseball since the 30s. Yeah. And Gabe said to me, Marty, 
I'll take you to church any day, any day you want and introduce you to 25 of the best guys you've ever met, but they're not going to win you ball games. Oh. <laughs> oh, and that was Gabe's, Bobby. that was Gabe's world. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Bobby's a great, I mean, you know, Bobby was, wasn't certainly one of the all-time greats, but he was, he was my all-time great because he just seemed like such a great guy. Yeah. And then when he came back to the Yankees and he was in the broadcast booth and he's in my living room every night, you know, it's funny. I can remember I was a grown man, obviously, when Bobby passed away. And I can remember hearing it and crying because it's like losing a member of the family because he's in my living room night after night, you know. I remember that day so well. We knew the day was coming. Um I had been in New Jersey at a memorial service for Monty Irvin's wife. And I was on the New Jersey transit train going back to the city when my cell phone rang and it was Kay Mercer to tell me that Bobby had passed and asking me to notify the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Protocol was a little strange there. so. I called Jason Zillow, the PR guy at the Yankees, and I told him, and he said, I remember he said, well, not that I'm questioning you, Marty, but can I really announce this? Are, are you totally sure? I mean, you being the source seems a little different. So I said, well, Kay just called me and, you know, make of it what you want. So. I, so they announced it on that basis, but that's how the story traveled. That's funny. Was there a reason Kay wanted you to be the middleman? She just knew me better than she knew the current people there. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, it's uh, it was a different time. It was obviously uh, Bobby. I was glad Bobby got back to the Yankees. I'm glad Bobby got to a World Series with the Yankees, even though they didn't win uh, that particular year. But what else about those years? Uh, is there something we don't know? I mean, obviously, it's been reported and reported for the Bronx Zoo. There's been dozens of books written about that time. I've read every player's book. I've read Billy's book. I've read everything. Is there something we don't know that that you would you feel comfortable sharing? Um, common knowledge. Well, I would share that the players were closer and maybe – closer than anyone would imagine for all the turmoil that seemed to circulate around them. It wasn't like they were divided into factions on the bus and on the planes. Yeah. They were united as a team with the determination to win. And no matter what was going on in the morning newspapers, saying things about the owner and the manager and all of that back and forth, they had a remarkable focus. Mm -hmm. They had their eyes on the prize. They knew what they were doing, and they were a terrific bunch of ball players. Um, a great veteran experience. Only Willie Randolph was a kid. Yeah, everybody else was seasoned and very professional. The uh, in the '77, '78, obviously, where we're talking about. And uh, again, just for a reminder for those who might have just joined us, my guest today is uh, Marty Appel, former PR director with the Yankees, and. God, I don't know that I could list your entire resume right now again uh, after our introduction, but I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, allow me uh, to <laughs> just call you that. I, I think it's probably what you're best known for, that, that and the books. Um, so back to those years, I mean, that, those are my two, two favorite baseball seasons ever as a fan, as a Yankee. 77, 78? 77, 78. 78 is probably my favorite year, just with everything that went on. And coming back from such a big deficit against the Red Sox. I mean, those teams, I mean, what was the, the dynamic with the team and Reggie? Was it, was it as bad? I mean, you just kind of alluded to the fact that it may not have been as bad, but. Well, Reggie had a tendency to make it a little difficult because he was his own personality. I mean, he could be a teammate and the players certainly appreciated his ability and his talents. But he was his own brand. Yeah. He knew the names of all the reporters. I didn't have to introduce anybody at the press conference where we signed him. Um, he was a brand before people thought of people as brands. So uh, 
knowing he, Reggie was knowing a very unique baseball person. Yeah, he was a great player, and I, mean, I don't know if he was as great as Reggie thought he was, but, you know, he was a great player. I remember a funny, funny story, and I can't even swear to the accuracy of it. Maybe you'll, you might remember the story. I, I, it's, it's been repeated to me from different sources. <clears throat> Mickey Rivers, who was quite a character, as you probably remember, it's attributed to him that the reporter, you know, when all the chaos was going on with Reggie and Thurman and Billy, uh, somebody came to Mickey and said, you know, what's your thoughts of uh, Reggie? He said, you know, he's all right. He's fine. He says, well, you know, he claims to have an IQ of 137. And Mickey said, out of what, a thousand? <laughs> True. <laughs> true story. That's a true story. Yeah. Stories. A lot of Yogi stories are made up, but uh, that that was a true Mickey story. <laughs> oh God, I love that one. I repeat it a lot of times when uh, we get into these conversations. I can't help but repeat that one. It's my favorite. Um. So, I mean, <laughs> what was your favorite team? I just mentioned my favorite season. I mean, as a Yankee historian, what is your favorite Yankee team? Well, you know, the, the, the 98 team, which was part of the Joe Torre, yeah. Mariano, Jeter years, I was no longer working for the club then. Um, but I so loved following that team because you became aware by midseason that this was something special. Yeah. This was going to be talked about with the 27 Yankees and the 39 Yankees and the 61 Yankees. And I remember even one day driving home, listening to the game on the radio and hearing, who was it? Probably Sterling and Kay saying, so at the end of five, it's Minnesota four and the Yankees two. And thinking, all right, this is a victory. Twins aren't going to get any more runs. Yankees are certainly going to get more than four. And I turned off the radio knowing that was a win. And that was the first day I felt like this is, these are kind of automatic now. These are happening every day. So too bad this year isn't going to be a full season because this year's team also seems to have star power in every position and not counting the, uh, you know, the little slip they had this very week with Tampa Bay, which seems to have their number this year, this is going to be one of the elite teams in Yankee history with an asterisk, of course, because it'll be a short schedule. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And I mean, they're deep. They, they keep overcoming injuries just like last year. I mean, Judge out again, Stanton out again. They, they just keep coming back and throwing people out there. Like, I mean... Urshela, whoever saw that coming. You know? I, I remember when they brought him up. I did, you know, and I follow the Yankees fairly closely, and I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> and I think, well, he'll be in for a few weeks, and they'll bring somebody in. Oh, he's a tremendous ball player. A team that Andrew Hart can't make the roster. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good team right there. Hit 47 doubles a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a shame he got hurt last year. I really liked his yeah. team, and uh, – you know, he he had a lot of he still has a lot of potential. He's he's still a young guy, so it's not like it's over for him. But and this year's an aberration, obviously. But I don't know. I guess since we're on that topic, I mean, what are your thoughts on? Do you think they should have played this season um, with this shortened seat? I mean, I've got my problems with the rules they put in. Obviously, I, I didn't think they should play, and they seem to just be handling each situation as it comes along. And yeah. Moving on, I mean, as we're speaking today, the Yankees and the Mets have a three-game weekend series all postponed. And they play again postponed. next weekend at Yankee Stadium, and I'm wondering, are they going to have to play three doubleheaders next weekend? My gosh. So The Cardinals have to play 11. Yeah. You know, it's, it's – it's, it's, I mean, they've done as well as they can do. I mean, maneuvering around this, I think. Because um, you couldn't play baseball in a bubble like the NBA is playing, I don't think. Um, it's unfortunate. And you, uh, I hadn't heard that they'd canceled the whole weekend yet. I assumed they were going to. I knew tonight was was not canceled but postponed. So that's a, that's a, you know, again, it's a shame. I, I hope they're able to finish the season. I hope they can keep people healthy. That's the most important thing, I think, right? 
That's the most important thing. I mean, I'm old enough to be the father of players. Yeah. And would I want my son in that situation, knowing the devastation that this virus has caused? I'm not sure. And yet they have to sort of go with the program and say, um, all right, I can man up, I can play. It's not that easy. No, well, I hope they do the best because we got to keep those cardboard cutouts healthy in the stands too. You know, nobody thinks about the cardboard cutouts and their health. I wish the Yankees had gone that route. <laughs> um, it's kind of Yankee-like, no names on the back, no yeah. cardboard cutouts in the stands. It would have been fun to see a whole tableau of um, Ruth and Garrigan, DiMaggio and Mantle, and Mel Allen and Bob Shepard and Bald Vinny and uh, Freddie Says. That would have been pretty cool. Yeah, that would have been fun. <laughs> and Marty Appel. Uh, somewhere in the bleachers. <laughs> put you next to, right next to uh, maybe Billy and Reggie. If you put you right in between the two of them. Yeah, between the two. <laughs> I would have liked to have sat um, with Catfish Hunter, even as cardboard cutouts. He was one of my favorites. Really great man. But it's, you, well, you brought me my next question. I was going to ask you who your favorite player was during the time you were with the, with the Yankees. Well, let me start before I was with the Yankees. <clears throat> I was a Yankee fan starting in 1955. Bobby Richardson became my favorite player. He was in his fan club. And we still are friends to this day, 61 years later. Oh, good for you. And good for him because he knew me as a kid in his fan club. But then I went to work for the team and we reformed the friendship as two adults. And today we speak all the time. It was his birthday this week. He turned 85. Oh gosh, happy so birthday. Very special guy in my life. Um, once I started working there, some of the players that were special to me were not people that would even be remembered by your viewers at this point. Um, Steve Hamilton and with Steve Whitaker and Ruben Amaro and Bobby Cox, who's in the Hall of Fame. But it was the guys who took the trouble to learn who I was. <laughs> so if they knew my name, they were on my favorite player list. Oh, that's cool. And, um, you know, as the years went by, some you keep in touch with forever. Traded emails with Mike Kickets um, this week. Interesting story um, in Yankee history. Interesting well. story in yeah, Yankee yeah. history as well. Yeah, yeah. The great trade. The great yeah. trade. Yeah. But um, but um, Taurus Clark, Taurus who, Clark died, who died last week. Last week. Another one of my favorite. One of my favorite. Um, um, very very unassuming, unassuming blue collar kind, kind of player, player, a working man's player. Um, I remember, does he I remember one day um, a column in Newsday had really criticized his ability to be a regular in the Yankee lineup. And we were sitting together on the bus and he was reading the column. <clears throat> and he said to me, I'll say the name of the writer, it was Joe Donnelly. And Horace says, well, Joe Donnelly, he'll be writing the same column in 20 years and I'll be fishing in the Virgin Islands. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like quite a character. And I always thought Horace got a bad rap because, you know, he was a he was certainly a serviceable Major League Baseball player for a lot of years. Yes, he was the definition of average, though, wasn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, and I, I mean, a whole era gets, you know, named for Horace now, and I don't know if that's quite fair. That probably not. Could have been the Fritz Peterson era also. Yeah. Well, as a, um, But Horace was in that lineup at the top of the lineup every day for a decade. And those of us who rooted for the team, <clears throat> we used to say among ourselves, wouldn't it be great if Ralph Houck would just throw the job to some kid out of AAA and go for it? Yeah. Just to shake, shake things up and give the fans something to get excited about. But he never did. We have some good second basemen in the AAA. Fred Frazier, George Zeber come to mind. I, I don't Zeber. know if those names mean anything. I remember Zeber, yeah. And it was just like, Give Fred Frazier a chance. He really looks like the real deal. He never played a single major league game, and it was always Horace on the opening day lineup. I think I think last week's guest, uh, Greg Pryor, got to play with uh, with those guys at Syracuse. I 
I'm pretty sure he mentioned Zebra's name as one of the guys he played with in the 70s. Yeah, Zebra wound up as a utility man and got a couple of World Series rings in 77, 78, I believe. Yeah. Well, it, so we uh, go, go back to catfish for a second because you mentioned catfish. And, you know, I've always, it's funny, my wife laughs at me because people I don't know, I judge them by whether I'd like to go out or sit down my back porch or sit at a bar and have a beer with them. Right, Catfish is one guy I want to have a beer with. Rick Nettles is a guy I want to have a beer with. You know, Bobby Mercer is a guy I want to have a beer with. That's how I judge people. I well, don't. Not Bobby Richardson. No beer. No beer with Bobby. That's okay. Bobby's so good. You know, <laughs> I'd so like that Bobby around. So it's just my way of. And I like good. Pe- I, I like to get a good vibe from people, and I'm sure yeah. not everybody that I want to have a beer with is going to be all that much fun to have a beer with, but. Well, you're going to have a lot of viewers of this who are not going to really remember the essence of Catfish Hunter, but he came to us as the reigning Cy Young Award winner in the American League, the first real significant free agent in baseball. He set the path for what was to come with free agency. And oh, was he good. And that first year, maybe on George Steinbrenner or Gay Paul's orders, they were determined to get their money's worth in year one. So he pitched 30 complete games. Can you imagine that? That's a 125 games. And <clears throat> he pitched with a confidence and a skill, and it didn't bother him if he gave up a home run. Mm-hmm. And instantly, he was the leader. He was the focus of your eye. Even you'd sense that if you'd walk through the airport with the team in the middle of the night the airport otherwise deserted, and you kind of get a sense of who's leading this pack of ball players here. Now I get this, he's been on my mind this year, Catfish, because I see the same thing in Garrett Cole. Oh, it's that funny, I thought- maturity, I that sense of leadership, that knowing yeah. how to talk to the press, knowing the right things to say, and the skill and the ability I thought the way he gives up a home run, doesn't really get phased by it at all as part of the game. He just pounds the strike zone, just like Catfish did, right? You know, it's fun to watch. So so it's, 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 okay. If you follow the history, it's nice to be able to compare a player of this era to past eras. And I enjoy that. Speaking of which, I wanted to point out my background here. I've been trying to get there. I was going to say where that water bottle comes from, but <laughs> talk so, about the um, background. This is, I took this photo. I'm not actually there. It's a background photo you can insert. No. And that is Huggins Stengel Field in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, cool. <clears throat> where Babe Ruth and the Yankees began spring training in 1925. The field is still used for local teams, high school, amateur. Um, It's no longer a spring training site, but it still exists. And those trees in the background, was always in the background of spring training photos that would run out of St. Pete in the Daily News and all the newspapers. So when I was in uh, Tampa a few years ago for Yankees fantasy camp, I took a day to drive over and meet a friend and we went to this ballpark and I took pictures and I spoke to some people there who remembered the Yankees who trained there through 1961. And it was a beautiful conversation and I felt like I was living history. So I took this picture and what do you know, we come into a Zoom era and I needed a background shot and that was perfect. Yeah, it is perfect. And then hide, hide your water, water nicely, nicely too. In the grass. <laughs> with that grass. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about. Um, I'm going to throw some names out at you. And you can maybe just give me a uh, uh, a quick answer on. You know, you know that's a Yankee anecdote, a Yogi anecdote right there. Which was, he was on some talk show, and the host says, I'm going to throw out some names at. Okay. So the host says, Mickey Mantle. And Yogi said, What about him? 
Well, I won't throw Yogi out because you just kind of gave me your uh, take on Yogi. <laughs> There's only one Yogi. I love him. Um, I'm thinking about some of the guys that I grew up watching. Mel Stoudemire. Well, I just exchanged emails with his widow, Jean Stoudemire, this very day. Because yesterday, uh, as we're recording this, yesterday was a day game at Yankee Stadium in the middle of August which are few and far between, sure. but I remember that it was Mel Stottlemyre's debut in August of 64. He came up from Richmond. It was a day game at Yankee Stadium that he started and he was magnificent and we knew somebody special had arrived. And in that game, Mickey Mantle hit like a 480 foot home run to dead center field over the batter's eye, over the backdrop. So it was for Mel to be able to say, oh, is this going to happen every time I pitch? <laughs> he was another one of those guys that had carried himself with that maturity and that leadership that you knew this guy was something special. Uh, his career ended prematurely because they didn't know how to fix a bad shoulder yet. And that was the end for Mel. But what a great guy to have traveled with and to have uh, been around. Yeah, he's a guy I hope to talk more about. I've been trying to get his son, Mel Jr., on the show. We've been exchanging some. He's busy with the Marlins. It's hard to get together. So I hope to get him on uh, to talk about what he's doing in baseball and his dad. Because Well, the Marlins may have a lot of off days coming up. So uh, Yeah. It, that, well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Thurman. Okay, so Thurman and I kind of started together. I started with the fan mail in 68. Thurman was our number one draft pick that year. Um, he came fast. I mean, 68 was draft pick, 69 he was already playing a month in the major leagues, and 70 he was rookie of the year. And so our career is kind of parallel, although he was going places. <laughs> and I, I wasn't necessarily. Um, but we had a nice friendship. We'd go out for drinks or dinner some from time to time. And then after he won the MVP award in 76, um, I approached him with the idea of doing an autobiography. And he said, I'm too young. I don't have enough to say. I said, well, people expect a New York athlete who wins an MVP to have a book. And if you don't do your own book, somebody's going to do one about you. Yeah. You'll hate everything in it. You won't make any money off it. So reconsider. And he did. And that's why we did the book, to stop anybody else from doing the book. So the book came out, and he died a year later in that awful, horrible plane crash. It really was. He updated the book and reissued it. And then the 30th anniversary of the crash, mm -hmm. My agent said, why don't you consider doing a full biography, which doesn't stop at the crash, but goes on to the aftermath and how he's remembered today. So that book was my one and only New York Times bestseller. And there's so many Munson fans out there who really relate to the guy and his gritty presence on the diamond that uh, that book did well. And his core of fans are still very vocal and very strong. God love them. For sure. Um, Hall of Famer? Tough one for me, and I'll tell you why. Emotionally, friendship, yes. <clears throat> but I have so much respect for the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. and their voting process that I, I lean towards that. He had... Uh, 15 chances with the baseball writer's ballot, and he didn't make it. Yeah. When that happens, I say, okay, the writers have spoken. That's the, that's the jury. So as much as I would like him to be in, and Gil Hodges to be in, a couple of other guys, they had their opportunity. In Thurman's case, counting the various veterans committees, he's had like 20 shots at it. Yeah. So it wasn't to be. My heart wants him to be there, but, you know, I get why he's not, too. But every year when it comes up or every other year, however often it is now, I hope it doesn't die out because I don't want Thurman to be forgotten. Uh, I don't know how he could be. Um, even the people that never saw him play, um, you know, 
people that I know in their thirties, they know Thurman Munson. Yeah. They're Yankee fans. And it's, it's really it's a, it's real cool piece of legacy. Um and one of my other favorites I gotta ask you about is Greg Nettles. Uh, Greg was one of the great fielding third basemen that I ever saw and that the Yankees ever had. His lifetime batting average was a little low, under 250, yeah. for him to be considered as good a hitter as he kind of was. I mean, he hit a lot of home runs and he led the league one year. And that, that reminds me of a nice memory. Um, he led the league in 76, which was the 15th anniversary of Roger Maris leading the league with 61. So um, on the actual day of when Raris hit his 61st, we had a home game and I invited Sal Durante to Yankee Stadium. Um, Sal was the teenager in the right field stands who caught Maris's 61st home run. So I called Sal, who was a school bus driver in Brooklyn, and I invited him to the stadium to throw out the first pitch on, from his original seat in right field. Oh, that's cool. And I got Nettles, who was the third baseman, to go out to right field to catch it because he'd already clinched the home run title. So he was going to, Sal was going to throw it out to the first Yankee since Maris to leave the league at home runs. I was always looking for a little angles on things. Sure. That's a nice Nettles memory. It's a nice Another Nettles memory I have though is I always produce the Yankee yearbook every year. And one year I put a photo on his page, which I regretted. It was a kind of an awkward swing. But in the yearbook, everybody has the perfect swing. Sure. And this one looked a little different and I used it. And he was in the clubhouse. He said, how could you use this picture? I'm probably fouling the ball off to third base. And I said, well, you know, you're right. And I'm going to apologize every time I see you for the rest of our lives, which I do. <laughs> well, that's, that's awesome. You know, he, he's in one of the, I have one great memory. Well, I have a lot of great memories of Greg Nettles. He's one of my, one of my favorites. I was an infielder when I was playing ball in high school and college and <clears throat> played shortstop in third base. And you know, every, in 78, well, you'd left in 78, but I'm sure you're still following the team, right? So tremendous, tremendous year. Everybody remembers Bucky Dent, the home run. What I remember is Nettles in game three of the World Series. Yankees down 2-0. They, they lose the game, the series probably over. And Gidry just getting hammered. Yeah. And Nettles is just picking ball. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Must have saved right five runs that night. One of the remarkable defensive games in World Series history. Agreed. You mentioned Bucky Dent. Um, I wasn't there that year anymore, but we became friends over the years. And one year at fantasy camp, I interviewed a lot of old-time Yankees who were there, including Bucky. So nobody had ever done this before, but I, I said to Bucky, how many times do you think you've listened to Bill White's call of a home run? And he laughed. He said, oh, I don't know. I said, more than a hundred? He said, yeah, maybe more than a hundred. I said, so do the call for me. <laughs> and he said, really? And then he said, deep to left. Yastrzemski's not going to get it. It's a home run for Bucky Dent. <laughs> <laughs> so to have him on tape doing that call by memory was a nice moment. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool story. It's funny because Bucky uh, came up uh, a lot of my conversations with Greg Pryor. He's a character. I don't know how much you ever interacted with Greg in short. Not, not a lot. But he's really a character. I mean that in the best sense of the word. He would have fit in great with those games. And I started off with him. He was reluctant to come on the show with me. And we had some by, by play back and forth. And I had told him, you know, Bucky was a nice player, but Greg Pryor could have done what Bucky did for that team. Your whole career could have been different. You would have been Greg Epstein Pryor. <laughs> Your whole career would have been different. But, and we had a lot of fun with that. He said, I'm going to get Bucky on the show, and you can tell him to his face. I know Greg Pryor is better than that. <laughs> I said, please, bring him on. I'd be more than happy to have the conversation. So it's funny you brought that up. Um, so what happens after the Yankees? You know, you have a, you, you've had a, quite a career even after that. I know you're even involved in, 
World Team Tennis. I don't think I actually knew that. Until I yeah, there were a few things along the way uh, which were fun, but not especially interesting to your audience, which is listening for baseball. Um, two things that I did, though, which would be of interest to them. After I left the Yankees, I went to uh, WPIX Channel 11 in New York, which is the home of the Yankees. And I became executive producer of their telecast so that Rizzuto, Messer, White were working for me. I was their boss, which was a crazy thing when you think of Rizzuto. And, you know, I was a little kid when he started broadcasting. So you're going to um, go home in a seventh inning every night. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I was 11 years at Channel 11. And strange as this sounds, because of the glamour of the Yankees, those were my best years professionally. That's interesting. I absolutely love the broadcast industry. I was also PR director for the station. So I had to learn everything, the technology, the news gathering operation, sales, community, uh, community uh, programming, uh, everything. I had to be conversant in all the things about the broadcast industry which I learned and which I loved. And then I became also the executive producer of the Yankee games. And that was a joy. John Moore is still directing the games on the Yes Network, but we were the team. We won Emmy Awards. Um, those were great days. And then later on, um, I became the PR director for the Tops company. And, you know, tops for anybody, all we baby boomers, that was our influence growing up. That's how we learned the game and the players. So I was a kid who collected tops cards in the 50s and 60s. And now I was the PR director for the company. And Cy Berger still worked there. And he was the father of the modern baseball card. And he was the one that went around and signed up all the players to contracts. So that was a fantastic uh, adventure for me to be uh, working first at Channel 11 and then at Tops. They were great. You certainly uh, had, a, had an interesting uh, career Like as I started great. out this, uh, lucky. Yeah. this interview. Well, it's good, you know, and it's good not to take it for granted, right? Because, again, we take too many things for granted in life, and I'm glad that, uh, to see that you don't. And, it's, it, and it's, it's clear that you've enjoyed that trip. Too. I'm sure that some of those years with the Yankees, there was a little bit of pressure at times. Um, in your well, yeah, but you know, I look back on it now, and I don't think of the pressure. I think of it more of it as exciting. Yeah, you'd go to work every morning, and you didn't know what the day would bring, but you knew you'd be on the back page of the newspapers the next day. <laughs> so bring it on. Words happy, I'm sure. So, <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about. Um, yeah, you got a new relationship with Cameo.com I saw come up on uh, Facebook the other day. I was invited to join this. Um, it's more and more people are becoming aware of it, but you can you go to their website, Cameo.com, and you can scan all these celebrities, uh, including baseball people, that can record a private message for you or a family member or a friend, whatever. And not only to mention your name in it, but perhaps share an anecdote of something of interest to you. So in my case, if somebody wanted birthday greetings sent to their father, his favorite player was Mickey Mantle, I'm ready. I mean, I've got my Mickey Mantle story I could share with them. And so it's an interesting service. I just enrolled in it this week and we'll see where it takes us. Thank you. It sounds like fun, so I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're continuing your association with uh, baseball. I guess that's not just baseball; that could be anybody, right? You could be, you could be there with George Clooney, I suppose. Yeah, uh, I think I'm probably more affordable. In fact, uh, so. <laughs> just a little. You were certainly were affordable for me. The price was right to get you on this show, so that was. Uh, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Sure. Our budget is very low at the moment, Marty. Very low. If you think about what you were making when you started in 68 and multiply that by whatever number you want. <laughs> well, when I started in 68, I was making $100 a week. Um, and Bob Fischel told me that 
he had to pull some strings to make that happen because they wanted to pay me $400 a month but a hundred dollars a week actually would come out a little better at the end because yeah, there's so 200 many. bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you didn't spend that 200 all in the same place. All right. <laughs> well, Marty, I tell you what, I've appreciated you having me on today and, uh, and sharing some of your memories about uh, my favorite team. We could probably go on forever, but you know, I don't want to keep you forever here on a Friday afternoon and you're, when you got such a beautiful ball field of, to play on here and um i'm going to say thank you and you know who knows maybe we'll circle back and we'll have another conversation at some point and cover some of the things we didn't get to this time it would be my pleasure i enjoyed this hour a lot thank you keith thanks again marty you have a great day you too bye now bye, -bye. so that was a wonderful marty appel uh what a great interview with marty uh, I spent 50 minutes with him. I could have spent four hours with Marty and I do hope to get him on again. And it's funny. I told a story about how I rate people and my wife laughs because, and I probably told this story on the show before, <laughs> but I rate people that I don't know and never have met by whether I'd like to have a beer with them. And Marty is definitely one of those guys. In fact, uh, after we uh, wrapped up the interview, um, we talked about when he was in, he, he comes up this way. He has some comes up this way. He's got Valley Cat games a lot. Uh, their future's up in the air. But uh, when he comes up, we're going to try to get together and have a beer. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do a live show somewhere. Uh, it might be hard uh, in this era of COVID, but maybe we can get together and, and do, you know, a little while at one of my favorite uh, brew pubs or something. It'd be fun. Uh, he likes a Guinness, but I've got some other stouts we can get him to try. So I want to thank Marty Pell. It was a great hour. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it uh, as much as I did, and I will have Marty on again. And again, Marty, when you see this, I apologize for it airing in November and not August, but it's, uh, technical issues that now I'm past and, uh, and also fortunate for myself having booked up the schedule pretty tight. So um We'll have Marty on again uh, next week, and you'll hear more about it over the weekend. Uh, I'll have uh, Rex uh, Walters on live Friday morning. Rex is uh, currently the assistant coach at Wake Forest uh, College Basketball. Uh, he'd previously been the head coach at Florida Atlantic and uh, San Francisco College. He uh, was a great college basketball player at Kansas, helped, helped them get to the uh, 93 uh, final, I believe. Um, and he was his 16th pick in the draft uh, the following year uh, for the Nets. And we'll talk to uh, Rex about uh, his career. We'll talk about, you know, the what's going to happen with the college basketball season. It's a little bit up in the air now because of uh, COVID. Uh, the Ivy League has canceled their winter sports, including basketball, men's basketball. So I don't know. We'll see where we go. We'll talk to Rex next week. And the following week, I've also got Larry Farmer, former head coach at UCLA, one of the um, not too far down the line uh, following the great John Wooden. So we'll have some some interesting insight from Larry Farmer about uh, his career. Great player at, at uh, UCLA and, and a head coach at UCLA and other colleges uh, as well. And we'll have him coming up at, as well as some others. Todd Stalmeyer will come up in December. Um, we talked about his father, Mel, uh, with Marty here just now. So guys, we got some good interviews coming up. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you guys following the show. Those of you that see this for the first time, uh, to the groups that I share to, I thank you. I hope you'll share it and I hope you'll follow us, uh, to, to see other, uh, content. Again, if you're seeing us in one of the classic baseball sites or, whatever site you're seeing the interviews on, I guarantee you there'll be more to follow um, in whatever group I've shared this with. So um, I think I might get a list of those and uh, maybe scroll them across the bottom of the screen here, the ones that have allowed me to share content. You guys have helped me a lot and you will help me keep this brand growing uh, as we go forward. So you guys have a great weekend. Um, I think it's going to be a little chilly and November-like actually here in the Northeast after a great week of 70-degree weather, almost a week. So I thank you. You guys have a great weekend. I'll see you Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We'll recap the college football weekend. We'll do our uh, we'll update the NFL. Uh, I'll do a 
do our pick switch. I am crashing to the ground now. Another three win uh, week last week, killed by uh, all four, three competitors that, that picked with me. Um, and next Friday we'll be on live at 8 a.m. Eastern Time with Rex Walters. We'll see you then. Have a great weekend. Keith Engel for TGI Sports Talk. See you then. Bye-bye.